Test is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi guys, uh, thanks for um, attending this webinar. So today we are going to talk about uh, top apps using Amazon Elastic Cash. Um, so um, you can post your questions uh, using the panel for questions and uh, we will collate them and uh, answer them through the webinar as well as uh, take a few of them and answer at the end of the webinar. Um, so uh, Rahul Patak is a senior product manager um, managing the Amazon Elastic Cash product. Uh, so he is going to take over and uh, start the presentation. Rahul. Thanks, Pavan. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. And uh, let's get started. So today what I'm going to do is uh, provide an introduction to caching and a very popular open source library, Memcached, which is used by many of the world's top websites. And then I'm going to tell you about Amazon Elastic Cache, give you a demonstration of how to create a cache cluster uh, using the Elastic Cache console, and then we'll explore um, how to create a sample app using Amazon Cloud Formation templates. And these are templates that automate the creation and deployment of AWS resources. We'll then uh, have some time, as Pavan mentioned, for Q&A and we'll attempt to answer as many of your questions as we can. And then also what we're doing for this webinar is um, for everyone who's attending today, we'll offer a two-month trial of the Elastic Cash and um, we'll give you details on how that'll get to you uh, at the end of the session. So thank you. We'll get started. Uh, so let's talk about a typical web application at a very simplistic level. Uh, what we have are users on multiple devices and, and uh, different types of browsers, web servers, and database server. And for the purposes of this discussion, we'll uh, focus on, we'll just call it MySQL, but it could be any form of persistent storage. Um, so in a typical flow, users will hit your web server. The web server makes a request to the database. The database returns the results, and the web server puts that result in the page and returns the page to the users. And um, as you scale, traffic goes up. And uh, one common approach to deal with this is to add more servers and more database servers to maintain the performance of your application so that your user experience stays consistent and good. Um, you know, this doesn't always work, or sometimes you continue to scale. And there are alternatives. And one of them is to use, uh, use a cache some form of caching system between your web server and your database server. And what this does is it allows you to maintain high performance and low latency for your users and reduces the load uh, that your database servers see. And um, so a cache is really a component in your system that stores frequently accessed data in memory. And um, typically, most applications display some locality of reference. And what that means is that data that's used once is often used again fairly soon afterwards. And so caching that data in memory means that you can return faster responses to that data, and it also means that you're spending less time looking up repetitive things on your database. And um, you know, most web applications today have very high read to write ratios, and often it's as high as 80 to 90 percent reads. And since memory is orders of magnitude faster than disk access, by caching this frequently read data in your memory systems, you can see latency go down to microseconds from milliseconds. Uh, so a simple example of caching, say we're trying to look up the phone number of a person, uh, something that doesn't change all that often. So the first time we do it, our cache is empty. Uh, we look in the cache, it's not there, and that's called a cache miss. We then go to the database, get the value, and update the cache. And so the user gets the value back, and the cache now contains um, the key, which is John Smith, and the value, which is the phone number. And so the second time we need that data, we look it up in the cache, we see it right away, and we can avoid the, uh, the database access on that round trip and get the information back to the user. Uh, so when it comes to implementing a cache for your web applications, Memcached is uh, a free open source solution that was developed in 2003 for LiveJournal, and it's been used um, I think at one point by 18 of the top 20 websites in the world based on user counts. And these are names that we're all familiar with, YouTube, Zynga, Facebook. And um, basically Memcache is, uh, it comes in two components. There's a client-side client piece of software, and that's main function is to map keys 
which is the items you want to store and their values to the servers uh, where the cache exists. And then there's software that resides on the server. And what that does is it maintains a hash table of keys and values to store the data. And it also manages memory. So it deals with what happens when items expire or when the cache fills up. Um, some of the other key concepts in Memcached, uh, it's designed to use multiple servers. And so the client side software contains hashing algorithms that decide which server a particular key will map onto. Uh, it operates in, on, as a least recently used cache. And what this means is um, it, as the cache fills up, when new requests come in, uh, it'll look at what was used most um, the longest time ago and remove that from the cache if it needs to store new items. Uh, Memcached also supports the idea of expiration times for objects that you store in the cache. And so it'll also look for expired objects if it needs to free up memory uh, to store new data. The other key component here is that uh, Memcached by default does not uh, persist data. And so what that means is that if your cache goes down, uh, all the data that was within it in, is lost. And typically, it's up to you and your application to make sure that any data that you need to keep around, you persist in a um, database layer or a file system uh, as appropriate for your needs. So the other thing about Memcached is that you can store really any arbitrary data um, in a simple key value form. And um, it's often used to store snippets of rendered HTML, uh, the particular user. And uh, it's often used as well in pr computational processes that are resource intensive. And so you can store intermediate results and keep the performance of your application moving fast. And uh, to maintain performance and low latency, Memcached limits its key sizes to 250 bytes and limits the values that you can store to one megabyte. And if you need to store larger values, you typically would split them across multiple keys or look to some alternative form of, uh, of, of caching mechanism. Uh, so if you're implementing Memcached today and doing it by yourself, you would download software, install libraries on your client, install software on the server. You'd be configuring it, running it, and managing it. Uh, you can do this also on EC2. And in this case, most of the steps remain the same, but adding nodes and replicating setup is somewhat easier. But you're still spending time managing your cache, and that's time that you're not spent working on your application. So we believe there's a better way to do it, and that is using Amazon ElastiCache. So Amazon ElastiCache is a web service that lets you easily create and use caching clusters in the cloud. It's 100% compatible with Memcached, and what that means is that you can use many of the dozens of libraries that are out there for client-side software, and you should be able to run them against Amazon ElastiCache unchanged. And like all Amazon Web Services, it's managed, it's scalable as you need it to be, and it's secure. Uh, one of the things about Memcached by default is that it doesn't include any form of authentication. And so uh, there have been cases where caches have been left open. And uh, that's something that's managed through ElastiCache, so not a worry at all. And um, it's reliable. Amazon monitors cache nodes and replaces them in the event that they go down. And so you can focus just on keeping your application running. And then finally, it's pay as you go. So you can add capacity when you need it and take it down when you need it. And so deal with um, varying workloads as they come up. And uh, just to sort of go through some of the, the key benefits in more detail, from a deployment perspective, and we'll walk through a demonstration of this uh, shortly, you can deploy multi-node cache clusters using uh, just a few clicks in the Amazon Web Services console or by making some simple API calls. Migrating applications that are already running Memcached is straightforward because the code is 100% compatible. And so once you update your configurations in your application, to point to your new cluster, you should be able to proceed without any trouble. Uh, administration is also simplified. ElastiCache will handle node replacement and software patching. And then CloudWatch and that lets you monitor, I think, about 20 uh, metrics related to your cache performance, cache hits, latency, et cetera. And scaling is also very straightforward. 
Um, here are just some of the uh, some of the ways in which some customers uh, are using Elasticash, and um, it's typically used to handle and make managing multiple node distributed caching environments easier to take care of. And uh, this is um, PBS using it into, uh, behind their media layers. Tapjoy is a mobile app network uh, that's deployed worldwide, and they cache stats and metadata. And um, mo backing mobile applications is a relatively common use case for uh, Elasticash since it allows you to maintain high performance on the client side, uh, typically over network connections that aren't uh, that great in the mobile world. And um, in terms of dealing with spiky workloads, Ticket Leap uh, around events has uh, traffic climb and then drop off as those events go away. And um, again, using Elasticash, it's straightforward to handle this. So a lot of use cases where um, Elasticash can really help in terms of managing out and helping you balance your uh, read workload and your database load are social networks, things like people's friends lists don't change all that often, but they're used by multiple aspects of their networks. Uh, gaming, where multiple people are in, in interacting with an environment that is relatively static. Uh, media and news sites, where there's a vast amount of read traffic compared to write traffic. Uh, the same thing is true on Q&A portals and on uh, review sites, where, for example, uh, the number of people writing reviews versus the number of people reading reviews is, uh, is very skewed. And then in areas where computation is expensive, so things like recommendation engines where recomputing everything is expensive, you can store intermediate results or previously computed results in your cache and uh, generate a faster experience for your users. So when you're thinking about deploying Elasticache and Memcached in general, uh, there's some things to keep in mind. Memcached is designed to be a distributed cache system, and since Elasticache is 100% compatible, it, it's got the same design considerations in place. And so multiple nodes, uh, and by this I mean multiple caching nodes, give you a higher overall availability and make your system more resilient in the event that any one node goes down, since only a small portion of your caching system would be affected. Um, if you had just one massive cache node and you required that to keep it your application functioning if that went down you would um, and so uh, another important thing to keep in mind when deploying Elasticache is uh, the client side library is where you control the key hashing and this is and by key hashing I mean how your your data is distributed across your multiple cache nodes and uh, by default most memcached clients use a very simple form of hashing uh, based on modular arithmetic and so what that means is when you add or take away a node you end up rebalancing your entire cluster, so that can create problems. Uh, there are a number of clients out there that support consistent hashing, and this provides for much less thrashing and rebalancing when uh, you're making changes to your nodes. Uh, the, the other consideration when distributing nodes is to just make sure that each individual node has the right amount of memory for your workload, so you don't end up with lots of cache misses. And uh, this is an area where Elasticache makes it very easy to test different configurations, because you can spin up clusters run tests against your application using your particular workloads and then find the ones that work best for you and move on from there. Uh, so in terms of deploying a cache cluster, I will um, I'll actually try and walk you through it live, but if not, I can demonstrate uh, the process. Can you still see my screen? Okay, and so um, here I'm logged into the Amazon Elasticache web console. Um, you can see we've uh, we recently launched. Um, we were initially in U.S. East, but we've recently launched in four new regions. So you can pick one uh, closest to where you expect most of your traffic to be and where your applications are housed. What then happens is um, you and I'll just walk you through the console quickly. This sh is showing you the clusters, which is currently empty. Their security groups, um, cache parameter groups, so you can edit. Um, all of the parameters related to your memcached setup and store them in a group so you can easily apply them to cache nodes or to clusters and then um, various events related to your caching. And so what I'll do is I'll walk you through creating a cache cluster. It's very straightforward. Select launch and then we'll give it a name. In this case uh, I'll call it webinar 
uh, you can then pick what type of cache node you want. Uh, the, essentially, one of the restrictions that we put in place is that within a given cache cluster, each node will be of the same type. And so in this case, I'm going to select uh, the uh, M2 4X large, which has 68 gigs of memory, and uh, we'll create 16 nodes. And default cache port from MCACHD we will leave unchanged. Um, no preference on the availability zone. And you can then set um, how you want to handle upgrades. So in this case, we'll leave a minor version upgrades on. And then continue to select a maintenance window. And what this means is you pick, uh, you pick a time slot during which we'll perform any system maintenance that's needed, whether it's um, handling nodes or dealing with uh, software patches and upgrades. And this way you can manage uh, any outages that would occur, and we would notify you uh, before any of these took place, and typically they last just a few minutes. So we'll go with no preference, and the system will assign uh, a maintenance window. After we confirm, we'll then launch our um, cluster. And so you can see it's uh, being created. It'll take a few minutes, and I'll, uh, I'll, con I'll continue with the presentation in the meantime. So I'll just walk through this quickly since we've seen all this. Uh, so one of the things uh, that comes up is some of, some of you and a lot of people are already running memcached on EC2 instances. And uh, migrating to ElastiCache and getting the benefits of a managed service is relatively straightforward. Just have to make sure that your Amazon ElastiCache cluster can talk to an EC2, to your EC2 application by making sure your security groups line up. And then you update the client node list on your application. And that's as straightforward as um, using an API call or uh, within the management console itself, uh, you can just copy a comma-separated list of your node endpoints and place them into your memcache um, client-side configuration. And um, we'll look at now CloudFormation. And this is um, a service within AWS which allows you to create templates that make it very easy to provision and deploy a collection of AWS resources. And so in one go, you could create uh, cache clusters, EC2 instances, connect them all together, and even deploy a sample application. And uh, we'll walk you through that process here. So the Elastic Cache sample template that was recently deployed uh, does, de does the following things. It creates a cache cluster, sets up EC2, installs a core set of packages to enable uh, a web application based on PHP supporting memcache and then gets the cache nodes, configures memcache, and you're up and running. And you can see um, this is a typical template, and these can be authored or also derived from existing setups. And so this is a great way for you to uh, replicate and redeploy applications uh, within AWS. And um, let me go back to the console, and we can walk through creating that. And this is uh, Amazon CloudFront. And there are no charges for CloudFront. You only pay for the underlying, uh, I'm, excuse me, I'm, uh, for CloudFormation, you only pay for the underlying resources that you use. And um, we'll use one of the sample templates. Uh, there's ElastiCache. And so um, these are fairly straightforward. The template URL is pre-populated. We then uh, continue, and you can decide what type of instances you'd like to use, the number of cache nodes. In this case, you'll need an EC2 key name. Uh, we have a, I have one set up. And we can start this process. And so now um, this is going to deploy a range of resources across AWS, and we should end up with a sample application that's talking to a memcache. Uh, an Elastic Clash cache cluster. So the process is now beginning. Um, it'll take a few minutes and we'll move on and I, I'll come back to this as it goes, but just to give you a sense for what's happening in the system. Um, it's beginning to create against this template. You can see the events 
uh, as they unfold. So it's creating uh, the cache clusters and then moving on from there and then setting up the rest of the application. And when it completes, you can see the range of instances it's created, all of the steps that it's taken, and um, it's, a, it's a great way to deploy applications that need Elastic Cache across Amazon and AWS. Um, and so now we'll have time for some questions, and I'll work with uh, Pavan to get them up. So uh, feel free to send in your questions. We have a few here um, that we'll start uh, talking about. Um, so this is from Matson. What are the best memcache client libraries for Java? Um, so we don't recommend specific client libraries, but on the um, on the memcached repositories online and at code.google.com, there are lists of clients for all major um, all major programming platforms, and um, that should be um, a good a great place to get started. So one of the caveats to note with some of the client libraries, especially uh, there's one called Spy Memcache, I guess, for Java, um, is that they tend to cache um, the IP address corresponding to your nodes. So I think defining uh, a reasonable TTL would be helpful because whenever, so like Rahul mentioned, one of the key advantages of Elastic Cache is uh, the failure recovery in case if there's network partitioning or host level failures. Um, Elastic Ash replaces the nodes for you, and uh, the DNS name would remain the same, but the underlying IP address would change. And so, um, being able to, uh, um, you know, understand um, or being able to use the DNS name instead of the IP address would be helpful from a client perspective. Okay. Uh, the next question we have is from Justin. Uh, can you auto scale the cache cluster? Um, at the moment, the cache cluster does not auto scale. Um, so it's something that you would do either via the console or the API. Uh, it's definitely something that we're thinking about and uh, exploring. Right. Um, is network latency that is using Elastic Cache but accessing from a web server outside Amazon's services an issue? Uh, so currently, the way Elastic Cache is set up, you it can only be accessed from within. Um, the AWS environment, and so your application would need to be running within EC2 to have a security group that would allow the cache to access it. Yeah, so the, the primary reason uh, we chose to go down that path, obviously, you know, apart from the latency constraints, right, so um, caching use cases are very latency sensitive, so you wouldn't typically want to have your web server placed, you know, elsewhere, far apart from your uh, cache uh, server. Uh, apart from that, memcached doesn't have uh, any built-in authentication or security mechanism, um, so we um, consciously chose to um, allow access to uh, Elastic Cache only through ECT security group, so that you know you have more security uh, for when you access uh, Elastic Cache. The next question is, um, sorry I was a bit late to the webinar, what is it basically that Elastic Cache offers? So I think it will be helpful to answer this question from a perspective of what do, you, what do I get out of Elastic Cache compared to managing uh, my own cluster on EC2? Absolutely. And you know, the, the biggest benefits of Elastic Cache are, one, that it's completely managed for you. And so Elastic Cache manages ma watches your, your cache nodes, you can set up clusters very easily, and you don't have to spend any time worrying about whether your cluster is up and down. You can monitor it in CloudWatch. Uh, if a node goes down, it gets replaced automatically. If you need more caching, you can add new nodes. Uh, and so, really, you spend no time managing your cache and much more time on managing your application. And so, while it's not, uh, while it may be somewhat um, it's not the most challenging thing in the world to manage an MCACHD installation yourself. It's just another subsystem that you have to keep track of, keep consistent, and keep keep monitoring. And that's one of the big things that we take away uh, with Elastic Cache. Can we uh, use Elastic Cache to enhance our web file server access in the cloud? Um, I mean, I'm not sure I understand exactly the question, but I think um, you can definitely use Elastic Cache as a way to really reduce latency for any accesses that your web server needs to do. And uh, it's not really uh, 
the storage subsystem that's backing ElastiCache isn't really a, a concern to the caching layer itself. Uh, it's really just about your application. Do you recommend using ElastiCache for an application which is used to get live cricket scores, a live match in progress, receiving approximately 5,000 score requests a minute? Um, so th that actually is somewhat of an ideal use case for ElastiCache because simply you have one source of data and multiple consumers of data. And um, since people are trying to get scores live, latency becomes very important. And so in that situation, yes, I think it would be a useful uh, addition to your application setup. Can you protect your ElastiCache network connection with the SSL certificate? So uh, right, we do not support SSL right now for ElastiCache, uh, but, but it's a great question. Uh, we'll have to understand if Memcached kind of allows SSL-based uh, uh, um, encryption. So that said, um, EC2 network uh, is essentially a very the network in which uh, packets get transferred between your EC2 instances is a private network, and uh, no packet sniffing would be possible within that network. Um, so um, as long as you use the EC2 security group, which is kind of mandatory for Elastic Ash, uh, you should be um, you know safe in terms of uh, uh, packet sniffing. And basic basic memcached does not uh, provide for any authentication. If you can talk to the port on the server, you'll be able to see the cache. What happens if you have a single node cluster and your node goes down? It really depends on your application workloads, but typically uh, a single node cluster going down could result in all of those all of those requests that were being handled by the cache cluster or the cache node going directly to your database or storage subsystem. And that could result in um, massively increased latencies and just backlogs and queuing of requests depending on how much of the load uh, the cache was handling. And in general, um, given that Memcached and ElastiCache are designed to be distributed, um, it's, it's generally far better to have more than one node if possible. I think another similar question, um, how does ElastiCache grant security? security? Uh, so secu ElastiCache defines, when we, and you might have seen this or noticed this when we created the cluster, but you have to define a security group. And that security group is the only place uh, and the only collection of resources that's allowed to access your ElastiCache cluster. And so you can define a security group on your web servers in EC2, and as long as the same security group has access to the cache cluster, that's how you would set up the security between those two, and nothing else outside of that security group would be able to talk to your caching system. Is there a significant latency includes our um, connection? to each other through uh, high network, uh, high throughput fiber. Um, so that said, um, you would have uh, slightly um, higher latency uh, when your elastic cache cluster and EC2 uh, instance are uh, split across availability zones. Um, so usually the latency is in the order of a millisecond or two. Um, so, um, you know, caching use cases, different caching use cases have different latency sensitivities. So uh, would be helpful to kind of try that out and how uh, and, and see how your workload reacts in terms of when uh, your uh, instances are split across availability zones. When adding a new node in a cluster, does it invalidate the cache? Uh, so this is um, this is something I touched on earlier, and it depends on the hashing scheme that's been set up on your client. And if you, a lot of the default hashing schemes are the uh, the more simple, just use modular arithmetic to rotate keys around servers. And in that case, yes, adding a node would create um, a lot of rebalancing effects. And that's uh, it's one of the reasons why consistent hashing is something that's recommended. And there are a number of stable clients out there that support that. And in the case of consistent hashing, far fewer nodes would be affected, so you'd see much less rebalancing activity. So I may need to leave in five minutes. Would you email the two-month uh, free trial offer to my email? Oh yes, sorry. Please don't worry about that. We will uh, we will be emailing out uh, the two-month offer to everybody's email in in a few days. So look for it, and we uh, we hope you'll uh, try Elastic Cash as a result. 
what is the difference between uh, snapshots and cloud formation? So um, I don't exactly know if uh, the question is about EBS snapshots, RDS snapshots versus cloud formation, but just to kind of um, um, give a high level introduction uh, to cloud formation similar to what Rahul um, demoed uh, in the presentation. So cloud formation essentially enables you to uh, define templates and uh, uh, use those templates, templates for AWS resources and use those templates to replicate um, your resources you know within a few minutes. So you can say that um, you know create uh, so I, I need to have a particular EC2 instance with a particular instance type. And so let, let's step, step back and talk about an application. So if you're talking about uh, a production application that requires a specific number of EC2 instances, a load balancer, uh, security groups that, um, you know, that you would like to define, and uh, an RDS instance. So this is kind of a stack, right? You have an application uh, stack with multiple AWS resources. So you can replicate that stack and create a, a production, uh, sorry, um, staging tier, a development tier with the same set of resources uh, to, ne to enable you to quickly kind of, you know, um, replicate that same infrastructure and continue with your development or testing or uh, even redundancy for that matter, right? So if, um, you know, God forbid, an AZ goes down, uh, you have uh, a cloud formation template that will help you replicate your infrastructure in a different uh, availability zone. So that's at a high level what uh, cloud formation helps you in it, uh, helps you to do. Uh, EBS snapshots are kind of completely different uh, around, so they enable you to take, um, you know, snapshots of, of your uh, EBS volumes and store them in, you know, S3 so that you can use that to revive um, either your application uh, instance or your database instance. Is uh, Elastic Cache available in VBC? Um, currently, it is not, but it's definitely something that's on our roadmap. What are the pricing tiers for Elastic Cache services? Uh, so the pricing tiers are they're all available on the uh, AWS Elastic Cache detail page. Um, you know, the M1 small instance starts at uh, I believe it's uh, nine point five cents an hour and uh, they go up from there depending on the size of the instance that you're looking for. Yeah, so uh, right now only on-demand pricing is supported. Uh, we will support reserved instance pricing uh, as, as part of our roadmap. Uh, is there any advantage to caching non-DB data such as static web pages? What other types of objects would be useful? Images? Um, it's absolutely useful. In general, anything that comes under the uh, one megabyte memcached limit that is frequently used and doesn't change often is a great candidate for uh, being stored in your caching system. And typically, applications will store not just results from the database, but they'll store pre-computed fragments of web pages. Um, you know, for example, on a city guide site, the top 10 list of restaurants might be cached so that on every every user from that city sees it and it's served from the cache and not recomputed in all cases. So Really, it's up to you to think through what elements of your application can be placed in there, but um, Elastic Cache can handle arbitrary data. Yeah, and uh, I think images is definitely a great example as well. So if you have thumb thumbnail images, you know, that uh, feed a retail website, so that will be a great use case for images. Um, when setting one up, if total instance sizes are consistent and I want to achieve similar consistent hashing compatibilities, and performance as a three node memcached cluster will a single node elastic edge do that um, so I, I mean I, I think the specifics of deployment um, would would really depend on your application and your workload but um, it, you know if I understand the question as can one elastic cache cluster be used instead of three nodes you can just set up that elastic cache cluster to have three nodes and then um, replicate that setup in, in a very straightforward way. So I think it's a related question. I noticed that for most of our memcached clusters, going beyond three node clusters in order to achieve consistent hashing degrades performance. Is the same true for node sizes for elastic cache instances? Um, so I, I think again, uh, I think 
a lot of these questions will depend on the specific application. Um, consistent hashing is, is really a hashing strategy, and I think that's somewhat decoupled from the number of nodes. So I, I would be surprised if that were the driver of decreased performance. Um, but I think it's something that can only really be answered for testing, from testing your particular application. If we lose a node in a cluster, do we lose part of the cache, or is it replicated between nodes? Um, the way memcached is set up, if a node goes down, uh, you know, by default it does nothing since nodes do come back up. And so, yes, you would see degraded cache performance um, while that node was being replaced in the case of Elastic Cache, or while you brought another node up um, if you were managing the cache yourself. And I think one of the key aspects to deploying memcache in front of your application is to really understand during testing how many nodes you can lose before your application starts to fall over. Can the cache cluster and EC2 instance live in different regions? How is network level security handled between EC2 and cache nodes? So um, you cannot actually uh, use EC2 security groups in one region, um, defined in region one in region two. Um, so um, in that sense, you wouldn't be able to access um, Elastic Cache uh, cluster in Region 1 from Region 2. Um, and that said, again, it, it's kind of very similar to one of the questions that uh, we talked about before. Um, so accessing a cache across regions imposes huge, uh, you know, network latency and, uh, you know, inconsistency in uh, uh, the uh, performance, right? So. Um, we would recommend against doing that, in, even if we were to support that. And uh, the next question is, uh, how is the network level security handled between EC2 and cache nodes? So we talked about the EC2 security groups, and uh, so you can define a set of EC2 instances and say that only these EC2 instances can access my uh, Elastic Cache cluster. Um, so uh, the security groups kind of uh, uh, the instances talk through a different network and like we discussed packet sniffing is, is uh, um, you know not possible within uh, uh, the internal EC2 network. Consider that um, I have a very small set of data that I would like to store but it uh, but there's a huge need of throughput. Is there a way to configure Elastic Cache to replicate data to all nodes to increase availability? Um. So, you know, I think you can, um, the configuration to achieve that is something that you would do on the client side and within your application. It's not really a recommended use case for Memcached, um, simply because replicating the same data across multiple cache nodes just tends to mean you have less available cache in total. But if your application doesn't have a, a large working set, that may be an option that works, but it's something that I think you would handle on the client side and it would override the default behavior of memcache, which is to uh, to distribute data across independent cache nodes rather than to keep data replicated across multiple ones. Yeah, so you could create multiple cache clusters and uh, replicate the data at an application level, uh, but uh, at a um, server level, we don't support replication at this point. Do you uh, have really detailed examples we could look uh, at after this webinar. Example with PHP and Java and potentially the file system. Can you send us a link? Um, so there's, um, you know, we, we do have documented examples on the Elastic Cache detail page. And um, there is a, on the code.google.com memcache repository, there are numerous examples um, of using really any backend store um, and uh, memcache D compatible system and Elastic Cache. Can you please define what a client is in, in this sense? So a client, um, a client in this sense is software. Um, for example, if you're running PHP, a PHP memcached library that would live along with your application code. And so in that, that's what we mean when we talk about client in the context of memcached. It's code that lives uh, with your application which allows you to configure your application to talk to memcached cache nodes and uh, allows you to perform operations um, with the cache. Can I use memcached on my own servers and then use AWS Elastic Cache for secondary failover auto scaling needs of memcached? Memcache. Uh, don't know whether this makes sense. Um, 
I think in theory the answer is yes if your own servers live in EC2, but I, I'm not sure that you really benefit from doing this. Um, if you're interested in achieving failover, one way to do it, as uh, Pavan mentioned, is to create multiple Elastic Cache clusters and do it that way. Um, but in general, you know, from a design philosophy standpoint, the cache and Elastic Cache is designed to be ephemeral with a persistent store behind it. And having multiple layers of it doesn't really achieve much uh, and adds quite a bit to your management management overhead and stack complexity. Can I use memcache? Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, can I wrap S3 requests using Elastic Cache? Um, so I guess uh, if you mean um, storing S3 related metadata in Elastic Cache, yeah, sure. Um, also, I think um, S3 uh, allows customers to um, create um, signed URLs that live for a specific amount of time that can be sent out to multiple users. So that's possible use case, but I'm not entirely sure uh, what does wrapping S3 this mean in this scenario. Yeah, but at, at a high level, if, if S3 is your persistent store, um, you can use Elastic Cache in front of it. Yeah, so you can either store S3, um, you know, in objects in S3 and put them in Elastic Cache for low latency access or you could store your metadata um, corresponding to um, you know, S3 and put that in Elastic Cache. Uh, again, it depends on the use case. Um, is Elastic Cache useful for worldwide multi-gigabyte downloads? That is DVD disk image download. I think that's a great question. Um, so we have another service called CloudFront, uh, which has uh, edge locations across the world that enables customers to um, move content near their end users. Um, so CloudFront is, uh, you know, very useful for, uh, I mean, it's like a CDN, right, so content delivery network. Um, it's uh, very useful for static um, and uh, high, uh, large uh, objects, uh, whereas uh, Elastic Ash is more tuned for dynamic small objects. So, um, and, and, you know, Elastic Ash you would typically use to um, connect with your application server and uh, uh, provide low, low latency access for um, small object requests. Uh, what is the maximum size or number of nodes that we can spin up in, on Elastic Cache? Uh, so on Elastic Cache we have a, a current limit of uh, 20 nodes per cluster. And um, if you want to go over that, there is a, um, there is a sort of a submission request that will allow you to go higher. Um, and there's no, there's no limit on uh, the amount of memory. It's just you can use the largest type of node and generate 20 of them if you would like to do that. Does Elasticash support Unicode data as well in key and value? Um, that is a good question. And while I don't have the, I would be, uh, I'm confident that it's yes. As long as you can store it, um, it, it will be supported. So as long as Memcached supports it, you can store it. Are there plans to integrate Elastic Beanstalk and Elastic Ash to provide a single scalable environment? Uh, so we are exploring how to uh, combine Beanstalk and um, and Elastic Ash, and it's uh, it's some um, and you know RDS is also part of that conversation, and it's something that is uh, is on our roadmap. Great. Uh, so I guess that's pretty much it. Uh, uh, so uh, I have a few questions. It will be uh, awesome if you guys can spend a couple of, uh, you know, a few seconds to answer them, uh, primarily to get feedback from uh, the, you know, for the webinar and uh, how it, whether it has been useful for you. So uh, first question here, did you find this webinar useful? And um, just while we're doing the polls, um, th thank you very much for your time. And we will be sending out uh, the, the credits for the two-month trial via email. And recordings of the slides will also be available. And um, you know, as always, feel free to get in touch with us. Um, and my contact information is on the slides as well. OK. Uh, the next one, uh, what do you think of the content level and the quality? would help us figure out if we need to get more technical or make it a bit more high level uh, in the subsequent webinars.
Great. And the last question, what do you consider Amazon Elastic Edge for your future projects? Yep, cool. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, we really appreciate your time.